Welcome back to part two of A Brief History of Microbiology. We're going to pick up now um, in the, in uh, let's see, 1850s, sorry. In the 1850s, um, this is about the same time as Florence Nightingale, and we're gonna add a man named John Snow. Now, John Snow has a nickname, and his nickname is called the Father of Epidemiology. And epidemiology is the study of diseases within a population. And the reason he's considered the father of that is because until him, no one was quite so systematic in solving disease mysteries of like, where did it start? Who was case zero? The kind of thing they do for Ebola these days. So he tracked down the source of a cholera outbreak. And cholera is a type of diarrheal disease that can kill people within a couple of days, and babies are very susceptible. Oops, let's see, track down the cholera outbreak in London. And he was able to track it down to a particular water pump. So back in those days in London, it was actually really, really, really dirty in London at that time. And people would just pour um, their all of their bathroom stuff out their windows. And there would be like little gutters that went down the middle of the alleys. And then they would all dump into the river. Um, and then people had water, uh, sort of wells, and they would go and get their water from that well but if the cholera bacteria was able to get in get from the creeks that drain down to the river into one of those water sources then it would be contaminated and that's what happened and so he used a map of like where all the outbreaks were in London to track it down like okay this is the pump where the people are getting sick and he did countless interviews all around the city, and he really turned epidemiology into a science, which it had not been before that. So it was to a specific water pump. Um, and he wrote, there's, or sorry, there's a book written about this called The Ghost Map, and it has a lot of details in it for sure. Um, I loved the book, and I've recommended it to students over the years, and some students also love it and um, adore it even, and other students find it a little too detail heavy. So um, I still recommend that maybe you give it a check it out and see what you think. You can find it on Amazon. Um, the other thing Jon Snow's particularly famous for is making anesthesia safer. Until, so they were in the early days of having any kind of anesthesia for surgery. And so he delivered uh, Queen Victoria's baby. I think it was her last one. She had all the rest by natural birth. And so you can imagine the pressure on this guy because anesthesia wasn't safe and that if it put you too far under, you might never wake up again. And now we sort of take it for granted that for the most part, anesthesia can be a fairly safe procedure. Um, so anyway, that's Jon Snow, so we will highlight his name in yellow and then draw a line. He was also right around the 1850s for the bulk of his contributions later, too, though, for Queen Victoria. Um, okay, so next up is a purple pen, and we're going to add Joseph Lister. And 1865 is the next date. Oops, 1865. So for um, people that live in the U.S. or from the U.S., they might remember this is also the year that the Civil War ended. And during the Civil War, um, people had, if they got hit with a musket ball, then pretty much amputation was the only thing they could do. And there was no, no anesthesia that was available. As you can see, Jon Snow was working on it at this time, but it certainly wasn't available for people on the battlefield. Um, and so... Um, what Joseph Lister um, 
was dealing with was a time when if someone had a surgery, even if they surviving the surgery was only half of the battle, and then infection after surgery killed so many people. And so what he did is he um, came up with this use of something called carbolic acid, which we don't use it much nowadays, or we don't use it at all for anesthesia. Anaset, sorry, antiseptic, um, because it is too harsh, very harsh. And so the people that would use this for cleaning would actually get rashes on their hands. And during the surgeries, he would blow this liquid um, in little tiny droplets, like an aerosol, all around the room to try and kill um, what he believed were bacteria in the air that might fall onto the wound. And he would soak the, um, the wrappings in this carbolic acid. And it was good at reducing infection after surgery, but it was also damaging to healthy cells. Um, a little bit like the problem they have with hydrogen peroxide sometimes now. Anyway, so this carbolic acid was used to prevent post-surgical infection. And this is where we get that word Listerine for a mouthwash. It was named after... Joseph Lister. So that's a good Jeopardy trivia for you to know, eh? Okay, so let's highlight Joseph Lister. And now we're going to move on to the 1880s, and oh boy, do things pick up at this point. Um, way more than uh, I could give you in a brief summary, but I am going to give you a brief summary. So just put 1880s on there, highlight that in green, and then uh, put on your seatbelt, because along comes the one, the only, the most famous Louis Pasteur. And you can tell from his name that he was a Frenchman. He is a French hero to this day. They have statues of him. They made movies about him. He was absolutely the most famous scientist that France could ever boast about. Um, and he was one of the lucky kinds of uh scientist that was famous in his own life. He was rich. He made it big. It's kind of like a Thomas Edison sort of richness. And one of the things that took him to greatness was the pasteurization of alcoholic beverages. So at the time of Louis Pasteur, the idea of boiling, which is what pasteurization is so named after him, basically boiling them so that you destroy any germs that might be in it. At that time, it would have been crazy to do that to milk. People thought of milk as something that had, um, you know, a lot of natural, like living um, nutrients in it. And it, the idea of boiling your milk would be an, kind of anathema. So it's sort of ironic that nowadays we pasteurize or boil the milk before it's sold and we most beers as far as I know would not it's not cool to pasteurize them anymore so there's been this flip but at the time when they had to ship wine in these big beer casts or wine barrels like across the world in a ship then they could sometimes get spoiled on the way and so by pasteurizing them he increased the shelf life of these alcoholic beverages and he became rich and famous. He's also known for another important industry um, bacterial problem, which was um, the silkworm um, is the larva that makes silk. And of course, you know, silk is very expensive. And they got this infectious agent that was causing them to not be able to make silk. And he was able to discover um, and identified that infectious agent that was um, harming these caterpillars. So he also was credited with the first rabies vaccine. Rabies is a virus uh, caused by a virus. And um, basically, if someone gets it, then they die. So getting a vaccine to rabies would be um, a very important way to prevent death from people that maybe have to work with um, animals. And, or especially, you know, like if they worked with animal control, for example. 
He disproved a theory called spontaneous generation. And he did this with a very carefully formed um, experiment that I'm not going to describe in detail here, but also, if, but if you find it interesting, you might want to look up how he did these um, studies. But uh, I will, t I'll briefly tell you once and for all. He kind of put this to rest. So this idea was that if you had, um, let's say, some beef broth on your counter and you left it out for a week or so, then it would get become really smelly and rotten, right? And what and he was like, okay, well, what's causing it to get rotten is microbes that are falling into it from the air, and they are growing then in this broth, like living off of the amino acids in it, and then their population gets so big that they spoil the broth. So um, and where spontaneous generation was, oh, it just spontaneously arises out of the beef broth, the rottenness. And so they didn't really think that it was caused by microbes. So what he did was he took the broth, he boiled it, so he used his pasteurization process, and then he, he um, remember I told you they're all tinkerers or inventors? I, that was in part one, but we were talking about guys that made microscopes. So he made this really cool flask, one of them, was like this and he had to make they're made out of glass and he blew them into this shape so you get it warm and then you can bend it and then he had one that was like this and they both were filled with beef broth and then he boiled the broth in both of them and then this one within a week or so sure enough it got rotten this one never did and that's because the microbes weren't able to get into the broth from the air and so he um so what that meant was he says that microbes caused the broth to spoil and this is the experiment he did to to um prove that so it was actually a really elegant experiment it's often discussed as like one of the great ways to really do science so then that kind of brings me to this next thing that along with the next guy we're going to talk about, Robert Cook, uh, Louis Pasteur helped develop the germ theory of disease. In this theory was that microbes cause disease. So sort of like many things with a pendulum, yes, this is true. There are plenty of microbes that cause disease. Streptococcus pyogenes causes strep throat. Bacillus anthracis causes anthrax. And we could name a whole bunch that are like that. But as, and so, you know, give them, give credit where credit is due. But in the intervening, uh, you know, 120, 130 years since then, we, we really have come to understand that just because the germ is there, the microbe is there in your environment, doesn't mean you're going to get sick. The strength of your own immune system has a lot to do with it. The types of microbes that are already living in your gut and living on your skin have a lot to do with whether you'll be susceptible to a particular disease. Um, and we could, you know, there are other variables as well. The amount, what we call the infectious dose, is it just a few of the organisms that would make you sick or do you need lots and lots to potentially get sick from it? So um, although this is a fantastic theory, the germ theory of disease is that microbes are what cause people to get ill. Not all diseases are caused by microbes and um, it's not as simple as you are exposed to the microbe and then you get sick. And hopefully that makes intuitive sense to us nowadays, but it still was a huge step in the right direction at the time. So Let's go ahead and draw a line from Louis Pasteur. This one's going to be a little funny looking, but I, I do want you to go from his name if you can. It'll make more sense when you're studying it later. And then go around Jon Snow and then up and around to the 1880s like that. Then get your green highlighter and highlight Louis Pasteur's name in green. I know you didn't, couldn't see that I was doing that. And then go down, 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 up and around, boom, like that. Okay, and now let's go to Robert Cook. Now, Robert Cook contributed a great deal to microbiology, just like Louis Pasteur did. Um, he was German, though, and did not get nearly the 
um, attention that Louis Pasteur did. And he also didn't get near the, so not the fame and not the money. But he developed what we now call Cook's Postulates. And I remember talking to a mentor teacher of mine many years ago, and he told me the one thing he liked to make sure his micro students learned about was the uh, Cook's Postulates. A postulate is um, like, I postulate that if you do this, so I theorize or I hypothesize or I argue that. So his postulates was uh, a very systematic method to identify, system, systematic, oops, method to identify a causative agent of a disease. Because remember, they thought all diseases were caused by germs in it for a little while anyway. Systematic method to identify a causative agent. And when we say agent, we mean the microbe and causative is the one that caused it. And the one that he got the most famous for doing this with was anthrax. And he learned that it was caused by a microorganism called Bacillus anthracis. Bacillus um, is rod shaped like this and it grows in chains and it forms these endospores inside of it that help it survive harsh conditions. So I'll quickly tell you this story. So Robert Cook is, um, you know, working with these farmers and the farmers once in a while their cattle get anthrax and anthrax can just destroy a farmer. It can wipe out all the cattle. And it's even so bad that if your cow gets anthrax, you would want to not only um, kill it right away, but you would want to burn its body. And then they even found out they would have to burn the fields on which, or at least not graze the animals. We'll probably burn the fields for a while so that they get rid of what are called the endospores. So here's what would happen. The cows would eat the grass and the grass would have these endospores for anthrax in it. And when the cow ate the endospore, it would germinate inside of them and turn into the big bacterial cell that could grow and make the animal sick. And then the cow would sicken and die and they start to like ooze from their body as they are decaying on the grass. And as they're oozing out of their orifices, more endospores go into the grass. So then the next cow comes along and gets it. Okay, so what did he do? So Robert Cook took a sample, a blood sample from a sick cow, and he looked at it under a microscope, and he saw these very unique um, bacillus, like these long rods, and he, he could even see the endospores. And he was like, that bacteria is in this cow that's making this cow sick. Now, he doesn't know for sure that that bacteria is the reason the cow's sick, though. So then he takes the bacteria, grows it on a Petri plate, and then he takes it off of the Petri plate. And after he takes it off of the Petri plate, so he's got these colonies growing on the Petri plate, and then he sticks it into a mouse. Oh no, I didn't practice this ahead of time. Can I draw a mouse? Doo -doo. That's a pretty good mouse. But then after he sticks it in the mouse, uh-oh, the mouse dies. Dead, dead mouse. And so now he says, all right, this bacteria that was in a sick cow is also making this, now let me give it legs, it's upside down now. This mouse died. And so then after he takes a sample from the mouse that got sick and, wait, did I think he put it back in a cow and it made the cow sick? That's a, like an expensive experiment though. They wouldn't, I don't remember for sure if they did that with the cow at the end. But the idea is, is then he, then he showed once again that all along it was the same bacteria. So after he took the sample from there and sure enough, it was the same bacteria that made the mouse sick. So that is what we call Cook's postulates. It's very systematic. Get the sample out of the sick animal, grow it in a Petri plate, put it in another animal. If it makes that animal sick, pull a sample from that animal. And if the bacteria match, then you've proven the causative agent. So pretty smart guy, great experiment. Okay, one more person to wrap up this page. We're gonna use orange. Oh, sorry, we have, with Robert Cook, we have to put a line from him over to the 1850s, just like we did with Louis Pasteur. Okay, 
last but not least, hang on with me a couple more minutes. Down here, 1928. Alexander Fleming. So he was a chemist and um, he would grow bacteria in petri plates and he noticed that one of the plates that he hadn't been quite careful with started growing some mold. Now normally if it grows a fungus and you're trying to grow bacteria you're like oop experiment ruined. But he noticed on the petri plate I'll use a black pen for this. So he noticed on the petri plate that wherever the back the sorry wherever the mold grew the bacteria didn't want to go near it. So the bacteria was inhibited by the mold. So he discovered that molds produce chemicals that we now call antibiotics. And they do that so they can outcompete bacteria in their environment. So they get to grow instead of the bacteria. So the name of the mold that he purified this chemical from was penicillium. So he named the antibiotic penicillin and hello, not dawn of a new era, the antibiotic age had come. People thought bacterial disease would never, you know, kick us anymore. But now here we are many years later, almost a hundred years later, I guess. And we now know that bacteria can adapt to the antibiotics and become resistant. And so we're sort of in a new phase now of working with antibiotics. They still can save lives, but they're not the cure-all that we would like them to be. Um, and now the idea of working with the natural human biome, the organisms that should already be on or in us, and maybe combining that with the use of strategic antibiotics could be a way to go in the future. Okay, thanks for your long attention. Um, good work with this page. And let's see, can I show you sort of the look at the end? I've, I know that sometimes people have asked this for me. Or I'll just do it like this. So... This is your final snapshot of this page. All right, see you in the next video.